Um, when we think of Pentecost, we often think of speaking in tongues, no? Um, and different people understand different things when you say, I go to a Pentecostal church. Some people think of Pentecostal churches are synonymous with noise. Yeah? A Pentecostal church is a noisy church. So I hope you guys are going to prove that right today. Someone once said that the, the quiet places are where the dead are. This is not a cemetery. This is a Pentecostal church. So I expect some noise. Out there, they call us the happy, clappy churches. Um, but these days, I realize that Pentecostal churches have moved a little bit from the happy, clappy. When I had just come to the Lord, when I just met the Holy Spirit, it was all about the noise and clapping. And that we, we had an art of clapping and it sounded like you're clapping on a microphone. Yeah, we were the happy, clappy lot. But these days, the worship leaders will tell you, they're somewhere here, or they're coming back in a minute. They, they will tell you that it's hard to get a clap from you guys. We have to bribe you with tea, coffee, all sorts of things. Mandazi, chapati. Please, church, clap for Jesus. Please, we will give you... <laughs> Nowadays, like the Pentecostals, there's a time when the Pentecostal movement was all about swirly music. Like we play the pads and we leave the pads suspended and we just play a D and keep suspended on that one. D, you know, and, and, and let the atmos change. Um, but the Holy Spirit was poured out to do much more than change the music genre. Hmm? I remember because I grew up in, a, in, a, in an Anglican church. I was Anglican to the backbone. And I remember that I loved the hymns. I still love the hymns. But for me, moving to a Pentecostal church was all about changing the music genre. So we left the Rock of Ages and we started all these happy, clappy songs. I am under the rock and all of that stuff. Uh, and in a sense, I was like, mm, I'm not sure that it's just about changing the music. I mean, you know what it's like when you come from the Anglican to the Pentecostal church? Even when they sing a hymn, the beat is not right. It, it just, it, it, it's not the same. But the Holy Spirit was poured out for much more. Somebody say much more. Let's read again what Sanyu read this morning. Acts chapter 1. And I'm just going to read verses, verse 5 and then verse 8. So you'll help me up there. It says, John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then it jumps and he says, but you will receive tongues when the Holy Spirit. You will receive upbeat songs when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive the power to clap hard when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I thought that verse was going up in a minute. It says, you will receive what? Say a bit louder. We will receive power when the Holy Spirit, power to do what? Because just before um, you were teaching us this morning ably uh, on hermeneutics. And part of biblical hermeneutics is when you read a scripture, you don't read it in isolation. You read what came before and it helps to read what comes after. So you understand the context. Now, Acts chapter 1 is placed after the resurrection. And all of the disciples, for the three years that they walked with Jesus, they thought he had another agenda, a political one. See, they had lived in oppression, and they were getting ready for Jesus to set them free from the Romans. 
So they watched him, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, and in their minds they were like, that's all all right. But when are you doing the real thing? When are you setting us free from those Romans that are oppressing us? And then Jesus dies, and they're like, it flopped. What happened? And then he rises up from the dead, and they're like, yay! And the first thing, when he comes back and manifests himself, the first thing they say, will you now restore us the kingdom? Will you now give us back power? And many times we are like them. I heard up more preaching that uh, many times we look at the Holy Spirit as if he came just to give you stuff. And it's about, Lord, will you now give me a husband? And will you now give me a car? And will you now fix my bills? But he's saying there's so much more to this thing than those material things. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Not just power to pray for your husband. And not just power to pray for your provision. But he says you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, eh? everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judah, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Liberty, the main reason why the Holy Spirit was poured out was to transform shy, intimidated, timid believers into bold lions witnessing about the power of Jesus and transforming their nations by the power of Jesus. That was reason number one. We must never let go of the principal thing. The principal thing is about us becoming bold witnesses. Bold witnesses. At the center of the story of Pentecost is this character called Peter. And Peter is an interesting character. He's like Mr. I think his name Simon was very prophetic because he's up down, he's up down, he's great and then he's lousy and then he's great and then he proper flops it. He's, um, he was called, Jesus called him the rock. And said over him that I will build my church and the gates will not prevail. So I imagine that when Peter was told that he, God will build the church on him. He knew that I'm the first pastor. Yeah. I am the first New Testament pastor. And this character who was the one who was supposed to lead those, that band of disciples to transform the whole world ended up in a few, few days before Pentecost totally belly flopping. He embarrassed himself. He let the side down. For those of you that don't read your Bibles very well, in the last days of Jesus, Peter, who had promised publicly to everybody that all of you will fall, but me, I will stand. I'm the man. I'm the rock. I'm the pastor. He embarrassed himself. And listen, it wasn't even two months ago. This was 50 days ago. Peter had stood and publicly denied Jesus, not once, not twice, three times. He had, have you ever done something and even you're shocked at yourself? And you're like, what was that? How, how, did I, how did that come out of my mouth? What kind of a person am I? How could I let the side down? And I imagine because it's, you know, people take a long time to forgive. And this is not even two months. Things are fresh, fresh, fresh. So I'm sure the disciples were still giving Peter looks. The whole 
Pentecost story is wrapped around this guy. Can you imagine the awkwardness of the upper room? It's fresh in everybody's mind. You let the side down. You didn't just deny the master. You swore. Pastor Peter, you swore. Three times. And it wasn't because anybody had a gun to your head. You did it because of a little girl. How are you the rock? How are you the pastor? Pastors are not supposed to belly flop like that. This Here we are, man of God, man of the hour, and he has belly flopped just because of the threat of a little slave girl. Peter, the star of the show, has gone from the highs of flesh and blood, has not revealed this to you. You are Peter. You are the rock. All of that stuff. And he has fallen down the hill. First of all, after the flesh and blood thing, the next sentence is, get behind me, Satan. And then he's gone from there to cursing and denying Christ. If I were Peter, I would have vowed to myself, I will never open my mouth again. How many of you agree? I would have become the quietest mouse in the congregation. What, what can you say? After you have stepped in it so properly, what are you supposed to say? But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he said, tell my disciples and Peter. He came and collected Peter specifically by name. Ah, I'm talking to somebody here who looks at themselves and says, I'm not sure that God can do very much with me. You don't know my story. Oh, yes, I do. Your story is all over the Bible. And God takes the things that are broken, the things that have fallen by the wayside, and he puts them up with the princes. He is great at rewriting the story. And he loves to write his story with broken pieces and broken people. And that's why I am here, because God uses broken things. God uses things that somebody else would have said, no way, how? That is the very material that God says, the Bible says, that God uses the foolish things. How many of you are humble enough to know that there's some foolishness in you? And if you don't, you're not yet qualified. Yeah, you stay with your cleverness. Because God uses the foolish things of the earth. The, the, you know, like the things that God uses us for, everybody will turn around and say, ah, no, no, no. Not Grace. Or not Betty. Not Tony. How? How could God? That is what God loves to use. Amen. So, he's the star of the Pentecost story. Hmm. And when Jesus is saying, don't leave Jerusalem yet, he is saying, Peter, there's something I need to do to equip you, to strip you of yesterday and to make you ready to become the greatest, to, become, to rise to your greatness. There's something, so don't leave Jerusalem just yet. Wait on the Holy Spirit. Now, those of you that read your scripture will know that J Peter had already had experiences with the Holy Spirit. The, Jesus had breathed on him and had said, receive the Holy Spirit. <sighs> Peter had operated in the supernatural. He had seen the sick raised. He had seen the lame walk. He had experienced God, but God said through Jesus, Peter and all you guys, wait. 
I've got something to unpack for you that is going to change you. I need to take you shy guys who are embarrassed about what you've just done. And I need to transform you into the powerhouses that will transform Jerusalem. Amen, amen, amen. You shall receive power and you will be a witness. And in a moment, without therapy, without deliverance lessons, without a sozo, Peter is transformed from the cowering guy at the end of the Gospels to this guy who jumps up in Acts chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, then Peter stepped forward after the Holy Ghost had come upon him. The Bible says he stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and he shouted to the crowd. The guy who had been in hiding for the last 50 days stepped forward uninvited and shouted out the gospel. You shall receive power and you shall become witnesses. Family, as great as the gift of speaking in tongues is, the real drive behind Pentecost is for God to raise an army of bold, declaring believers. Yeah. Because if the first church had just received the Holy Spirit and spoken in tongues, you and I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Because the gospel would have died there in the upper room. But because they received power to declare, somebody say power to declare. Power to declare. Because they did that, that is why the mission happened. The mission of God, 100%, depends on us declaring the good news. Mm -mm, that one you need to tell your neighbor. The mission, 100%, declares on you opening your mouth and declaring the good news. Say it to yourself, the mission, 100%, depends on me being bold in 2024, in a semi-atheist country, in the midst of political correctness, in the midst of anti-theism, in the midst of anti-Christ spirit, me putting on boldness and declaring that Jesus is still Lord, he still heals, he still delivers, he still sets the captive free, and right is right and wrong is wrong. That is what the Holy Spirit came to do, to give us boldness. Boldness to declare a revolutionary gospel. Power to speak against the powers that be. This Peter, who could not even accept that he was with the Galilean, stood up and he said, you guys, you killed the anointed one. And he gave them uncomfortable news for, for the whole of chapter 2 and by his word clothed in the power of the Holy Spirit 3,000 were swept into the kingdom somebody say God give me the spirit of boldness baptize us again with boldness fill us with boldness the boldness to declare the boldness to declare. I want you to jump to Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Today I'm talking about being bold. Acts chapter 40, 4 verse 13. This guy, Peter, who a few, you no, know, two months ago, two months is not, do you even guys even remember what you were doing two months ago? It's like yesterday. The Bible says this concerning the transformation in his life. 
it says the members of the council. We are not talking about the small slave girl. Sorry, those of you who are not Ugandan, come in small. <laughs> We're not talking about the small slave girl that intimidated him before. He is now standing in front of a council. Do you understand council? Maybe you understand parliament. He is standing in front of parliament, in front of the guys that killed Jesus. He is not in a corner somewhere by a fire. He is on the front line. Dealing with the very guys he had handing out the sentence to Jesus. Two months after the day. Can you imagine? But for the Holy Spirit it is impossible. But this, we've skipped a chapter because a chapter before Peter had stood up in front of all of Israel, healed the sick, had the boldness to tell somebody who was a, a, a lame to walk. And now, now the, he's in front of parliament and he says this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. I like it, I like it, I like it a lot. The people around you will be amazed when they see the boldness of the Holy Spirit, when they see what the Holy Spirit can do with a vessel that is yielded. Amen. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that these were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They did not know the hermeneutics. They did not know the Greek and the Latin. These were fishermen who spoke rough. They did not know. They hadn't been to Bible school. They hadn't sat under a rabbi. They did not know A from Z. All they had was they had received power from above to become bold witnesses of the gospel of Jesus. And everybody could see both. They could see that these are guys who are not schooled. But they could see a boldness that was not normal. A boldness that came from the Holy Spirit. And they had no special training in the scriptures. And these guys recognized that these ones must have been with Jesus. I hope I'm stirring somebody's passion this morning for more of the Holy Spirit than just time. Don't get me wrong. I love speaking in tongues. I love communing with God in the secret place in tongues. I know that it lifts our spirits. But that is not all the Holy Spirit came to do. He came to clothe us with power. And to make us effective witnesses to the gospel of Jesus. Amen. These guys who a month ago were so scared that they were all in hiding. By the way, there wasn't a single one of them who stood up and said, me, I'm for Jesus. If you want to beat me, beat me. Not even one. Not even John who used to sleep in the bosom of Jesus. The Bible says concerning John that he followed from afar and he's the one who did the best. Those guys were so baptized with power that when the authorities looked at them, they said the last time we saw anything like this was Jesus. Ah, tell your neighbor, God is going to do something with you that will remind your family about Jesus. That will remind your, your school about Jesus. That will introduce your school to Jesus. May God baptize this church with fresh fire. The fire that makes us bold witnesses. Hmm. Amen. Now, I want you to follow me. The story continues. After, you know that they've had Acts chapter 1, they've had the promise. Acts chapter 2, Sanya read, read this morning. Uh, a wind came and a fire and they began to speak in tongues. And Peter gets up and he proclaims the gospel 3,000 Come to the Lord. Next chapter, a lame man. Was it a lame man or a blind man? Blind? 
anyway, him, chapter 3, is healed publicly. No way that anybody can deny it. The whole city is shaking with this big, uh, I love the way that the scriptures say that there was, we can't deny the miracle. So they called them aside and they said, we can't deny the miracle, but just shut up. Yeah, enjoy your faith quietly in your upper room. Just don't tell people about the name of Jesus. And these guys turned around and they said, "Ha! Ah, judge for yourself whether we should be obeying you or we should obey God. Then we get to chapter 4. And the pressure is on. Someone say pressure. Let me tell you something about our enemy. Can I introduce your enemy to you? The most persistent thing in the world, I'm not giving credit, but the devil is persistent. Absolutely persistent. I, if I was him, at Acts chapter 3, I would have said that these guys are gone. Let's leave it. But he keeps the pressure on. I don't know about you, but when I came to the Lord first, I was waiting for the day when life just goes smooth. How many of you were like that? You're waiting for the day when the pressure stops and the problems stop and life just becomes easy like Sunday morning. You did it like everything just happens. You slide and glide into the breakthrough and it's breakthrough after breakthrough and happiness after happiness and no one in church looks at you funny and there's no lack and everything is good. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But our enemy never stops. Pressure after pressure. Not party. It's like pressure. You come out of this one. You got a house. Now you can't pay the mortgage. You married a wife. Now you don't know what on earth you were doing. You had children. Now the children have taken over your entire life. It's just pressure. So they've, they've preached the gospel. Now, the pre- and how many of you know that the pressure goes from glory to glory? <laughs> you just thought last year was bad and then you started this year and you're like, what? What's going on? So Peter has managed to speak publicly, to preach publicly. Now he is in front of the entire parliament and the pressure is on. Hmm? Now the leaders of the government. How many of you have ever been persecuted directly by the government? Don't lie, we are in church. (laughs) Minority. I've never been called before the MPs. Maybe you've been called before your boss at work. That's bad enough. These guys have the entire religious sector and the entire government shutting them down. And they're saying to them, we're not asking you to stop praying. We're just asking you to stop talking. And how many of you know it's never changed? They continue to say, you guys, it's okay, pray. But don't talk. Pray quietly. Don't share the gospel. Don't make us change our religions. Don't tell us what the Bible teaches because the Bible is 2,000 years old and we are 2024. May God raise an army that knows that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever and his word does not change and we are not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God 
unto salvation for the Jew, for the Gentile, for the English man, for the African man is the same power. There's not going to be another power. There's not going to be another Messiah. There's not going to be another answer for the kids that are killing each other on the street. There's no other answer. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. You can put them in through therapy or whatever you want to do. The answer is Jesus. We can educate them to death. The answer is Jesus. We can tell them about tolerance, but nothing changes the human heart except the power of God. It is the power of God. And that is why the enemy is shutting the church up. Shh. Believe your God, but be quiet. Okay, even heal the sick, but don't tell people that the sick healed in Jesus' name. He's always shutting you up. But the church is going to find a voice. LCF is going to find their voice. The Holy Spirit is going to baptize us with fresh power and we will find our voice. Say to yourself, I will find my voice. I will be a witness. I will speak of this God. I will speak of this God. I will speak of this God. So chapter 4, they've been locked up. They've been bullied. All of this sort of stuff. And verse 23 of chapter 4. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the repeaters, all the believers, someone say all the believers. All the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. And they said this, O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in me, and now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Hear their threats and give us boldness. Not shut up their threats and give us peace. Hear their threats and give us boldness. Not deliver us from these guys and take us to a nation where there are no threats. Hear their threats and give us boldness. Not deliver us from people that persecute us and let a spirit of understanding fall upon them. No, give us boldness that we may declare your world. This Pentecost... I just want to draw our attention to a few things. Are you ready? Number one. Fear is universal. We've just been talking about Peter. When he denied the Lord, it wasn't because he doesn't love the Lord. It was fear. Fear makes you do the most stupid things. And the truth is, Nobody is immune to fear. We all have fears. <laughs> I was going to say shout out your fear. I don't know whether it is arachnophobia, mice. You know, like uh, my husband always tells me that mouse is more scared of you than you are uh, of it. Somehow... That message has never got home. <laughs> I still have an issue. <laughs> Fear is universal. We are dealing with the rock, the pastor. Ask Pastor Tony. When you become a pastor, it, fear does not die. You operate in spite of it. Fear is universal. We're talking about Peter who walked on water. Nudge your neighbor and say, have you tried? When everybody else was cowering in the boat, he walked on water. We're talking about Peter who spoke when all his colleagues were quiet. 
We're talking about the rock on which the church was built. We're talking about their first pastor. And he too was vulnerable. He too was full of fear. Unexpected fear. Because it hit him when he didn't expect it. He expected to be the one that stands when all the disciples fell. That was his, he said it. He said, Master, these guys can all fall but me. Mm -mm. Cowboy, never die. <laughs> and then he crumbled unexpectedly. You ever done something and you're like, how did I do that? Even the mighty crumble. Even the mighty disappoint. Even the mighty disappoint over small things. And you're looking at the size of the problem and the caliber of the man and you can't understand. But fear is universal. Number two, fear is the greatest hindrance to multiplication. Mm. If the disciples had remained in the place of fear, the church would never have got to Africa or the ends of the earth. Fear is the greatest enemy of multiplication. Do you remember the story of the talents? Those of you who read your Bible, the Bible says that one got five talents the other got two, the other got one. The story is in Matthew 25. How many of you remember what the guy with the five did? He multiplied it. He took a risk, did some sort of investment, some business, and multiplied. And the guy with the two. And the guy with the one, what did he do? He hid it. And why did he hide it? This is what he says. The servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. First of all, when you're in the wrong, don't start by abusing. <laughs> Master, I knew that you are a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering. <laughs> Hello, how do you speak to your boss like this? You didn't cultivate. But listen, I was afraid. I was afraid that I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Sometimes fear looks like caution. Sometimes fear looks like common sense. Sometimes fear looks like political correctness. But always, 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 the mission of fear is to hinder progress and growth and multiplication. Thank you, Stella. The mission of fear is to hinder growth. Number three. As faith is the outcome of hearing God's word, fear is the outcome of hearing the devil's lies. As faith is the outcome of hearing God's word. Fear is the outcome of hearing the devil's lies. The Bible paints a story in Genesis. And this morning, Pastor Teach said, if we don't touch Genesis, we haven't preached. I'm starting to preach now. In Genesis chapter 1. Yeah, no, actually, I'm not in Genesis no, chapter 1. I'm in verse, chapter 3. <laughs> I've done 1 and 1, yeah? Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that the serpent came and whispered some lies to Eve. And Eve listened. He said to her, the reason why God is stopping you from doing that eating from the, the tree that's in the middle of the garden. The reason why he's doing it 
is because he wants to withhold wisdom from you. So what is he, what fear, what is he planting? God is not trustworthy. God has a bad plan. God is hiding something from me. God is withholding stuff from me. God is going to let me down. All of those things were introduced by the lies of the enemy. Right? And um, so then the verse, verse 9 says, Then the Lord called out to man, because as soon as, as the lies of the enemy were introduced, fear was introduced. And when fear was introduced, they suddenly recognized we are embarrassed. We need to cover up. Something's missing from us. And the next thing they did was they hid. And the Lord called to man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard you walking in the garden, garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And he said to him, who told you? I want you to look at somebody and say, that fear is because something the enemy told you. And the Holy Spirit needs to undo it. Because that fear locks you in a place where you cannot be fruitful. You cannot be fruitful and fearful. Hmm? When the liar has been at work, fear is evident. And the base of all fear is lies. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Point number four. The Holy Spirit has been poured out to free us from fear. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit has been poured out to set us free from fear. Can I, can I testify? This is my testimony. I stand by it. I always, you know, like how Paul says, I was on the road to Damascus. Whenever they called for a testimony, he would always say, I was on the road to Damascus. So I came to the Lord as a child. I was 11, going 12. And I was the first person in my family to give my life to Christ. And so there was no precedent. There was nowhere to hide. And I was a super, super fearful child. Full of rejection. Very shy. I didn't like to talk to anybody. It was rare to hear my voice. What a Holy Spirit. <laughs> you never would have caught me here standing in front of a mic with this thing looking at me in the face. No, 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 no. No, that was not me at all. I was shy, shy, shy. So I heard the gospel in school and I put up my hand, but I was so scared that when they said those who are giving their lives to the Lord walk forward, I did not walk forward. Because I was thinking in front of this entire uh, uh, not me. Lord, you can see my heart. So at the end of the conference, I was like what do I do? I know something's changed inside of me, but what do I do? And so at the end, they, were, they divided up groups. They said, those of you who have given your lives to Christ, go to this corner. Those of you who are recommitting, go to this corner. So because of fear, I did not go to the newly, the new ones. Because I saw a friend in the recommitted people. And I was like, at least there, I won't be alone. I won't stand out. So I went to the recommitment people. And they were like, you guys know what to do. So go and do it. So I was like, oh, <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? So long and short, what I was getting at, I could not tell my family that I had given my life to Christ. For three months, I was silent. I knew something had happened. We went out. And my best friends hadn't given their lives to Christ. And they were like, phew, that was close. We almost gave our lives to Christ, all of this stuff. And I was like, I don't know how to tell them. I, I just couldn't open my mouth. Too scared. Too full of fear. Three months down the line, somebody, I, I was in, it's something about the presence of God that always gets me. So we were in a service, a normal service, and 
They're singing a song. And I raised my hand. And I was worshipping with my eyes closed. And somebody said. <laughs> so she came at the end. And she said. Are you a Christian? Have you given your life to Christ? And I was like. Yes. So she said. Tonight. Come with us for a prayer meeting. So we went for a prayer meeting. And that night. I was gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit. Spoke in tongues the whole nine yards. I'm not lying. Like night and day. That day, I told that dormitory. I told people. I went home. I told everybody. I have given my life to Jesus. Within less than a year, my family, except for one, all came to the Lord. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. He sets us free from fear. And today, I want to take a few minutes. Isaac, if you don't mind jumping on. I want to take a few minutes to pray that God will free us from fears. I don't know what your fear is. And I don't know what is hindering you. I don't know what is holding you back. But we shall receive. We receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. We receive boldness when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. Point number five, this baptism of the Holy Spirit was not just for the apostles. It was not just for the church leaders. It is not just for the excitable people who sit towards the front of the church. No, no, no. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is up for all flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all. The young will pro the young and the old the old men will dream dream the young ones will prophesy. This is for us all. And acts, if you read acts if I were you this month I would read acts and see what you're supposed to look like. Acts is supposed to mirror who we are. Amen. Now I just wanted to show you that in Acts, the next chapter, Acts chapter 5 or is it chapter 6? God makes sure that he makes us understand that the spirit of power and boldness is not just for the apostles. Some little usher called Stephen jumps out of the woodwork. He has been relegated. His job is to provide tea and coffee and to clear up afterwards and to serve the widows. But the Bible makes sure that we see that Stephen is not just restricting himself to serving tea and coffee. I'm talking to somebody here. And the Bible says that Stephen rose up and began to work miracles by the hand of God. God. Somebody forgot to tell Stephen that it is the acts of the apostles and Stephen said even though I'm not an apostle, I am an usher. I will still have a chapter dedicated to myself because I also received the power. And Stephen stood in the power of the Holy Ghost in the midst of persecution. Nobody knew of Stephen before that day. But now we celebrate him as the first martyr. As he stood and boldly proclaimed Jesus. I believe that Paul came to the faith because of Stephen. Because the Bible says that Paul was witnessing what Stephen was doing and what happened with Stephen and he was agreeing with it but while he was agreeing with it the Holy Ghost started to work on the heart of Saul and on the road to Damascus Saul was transformed into Paul and all of the almost all of the New Testament was written why because Stephen was clothed with boldness and proclaimed Jesus I want to end so we can pray this baptism in the Holy Spirit, because some of you have switched off long ago, I can't see you. Even half asleep. Tell your neighbor, I don't know whether they're talking about you. But listen, listen, listen. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a one-off job. Let me say it again. Because some of you are like, ah, me, I speak in tongues. I received he is one from glory to glory.
to glory, we drink and we drink. And the more of him we want, we have the more effective we are. The more, more of him we receive, the more powerful we are. The more of him we receive, the more bold we become. The more of him we receive, the more powerful we are. The more of him we receive, the more that we are able to change our neighborhoods. The more of him we receive, the more we understand mysteries. The more of him we receive, the more we are sent out. The more of him we receive, the more our neighborhoods are changed. Can you hear me? Do you hear? Do you hear me? We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over. You say, Pastor Grace, I received, but for me, it did not work. Go back. Let us come back into the presence of God and drink more. Nobody, I'm not a drinker, I've never drunk alcohol in my life, but I've never seen a drinker who gets drunk on the first sip. Even those of us who are not uh, like virgins to alcohol, you don't get drunk on the first sip. You drink and drink until it starts to affect your behavior, until it starts to make you happy for nothing. That is the same way with the Holy Spirit. We drink and we drink and we drink until something begins to happen that makes people say, what is this? What happened to Subi? What happened to Sanyu? What happened to Admire? What happened? What has come upon? Who is this? Who are these? Who is their mother? Who is their, where, what is, what happened in Liberty Christian Fellowship? What happened? Why are they suddenly all over the streets? Why are they suddenly all over Croydon? Why are they suddenly all over Mitcham? What happened? We came back to the place of the Holy Spirit and we said, fill us again. Fill us again one more time. 